Good morning. Welcome to worship with First English Baptist Church. So good to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you for coming this morning. And I want to uh, alert you to especially pay close attention to Steve and enjoy his music this morning because tomorrow he has a little surgery on his hand, on his thumb specifically, and it's going to go well, it's going to go perfectly, but he's going to need some time to heal. So um, he's playing the Sunday. Thank you very much. Uh, but the next few Sundays, Carolyn's going to be covering, Carolyn's going to be doing about four people's jobs up here. So I'm sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> I can't play the piano, though. So, <laughs> um, But if we have any volunteers, you know, we could recruit some folks. But Carolyn's going to cover for Steve, and we hope that he'll be back sooner rather than later. But at least give him the month of April, and then after that, you can bug him all you want to come back, okay? Because we'll really miss you. Thank you. We're... We'll pray for a, a very successful surgery tomorrow. Um, several announcements here this morning. Karen's going to come up. Um, go ahead, Karen. Yep. Yeah. That's all right. Take your time. Good Very morning. Much. Number one, there will be adult Sunday school class, uh, class today. Just give me a minute with cleaning up for communion. Um, but I will be up, and I do have a lesson prepared. Number two, I was a little disappointed in our Easter flowers. Some were over, overripe and some were underripe. And, um, so I took myself to the florist and I wanted to understand why. And I had a 40-minute educational in service. Um, we have some very conscientious, wonderful people who supply our flowers. And now I understand why it's very difficult to get Easter flowers to the prime point all at once. Um, having said that, I didn't go expecting anything, but now I have a whole box of flowers at the back of the church um, that he gave me. Uh, I didn't want them. I didn't go for that reason. But please, please take these flowers and the tulips. Um, take them to people who would enjoy them that are shut in, whatever. Please just get them out of here, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Karen's such a conscientious deacon chair. You won't believe all the things she does. Thank you very much. Um, I need to make a, a quick announcement um, for the benefit of a new program that we're starting in church, renewing an old program, actually. Uh, Don and Bonnie Shoemaker have been active in Scouts forever, and they continue to be active in Scouts. They were active when we had a, a troop here before, and, and they still are in the council and in the larger national scouting community. They really want to uh, get an explorer program, a maritime explorer program. We're going to build a lake back here, and we're going to put boats on it. No, no, no. <laughs> But it is a maritime program, okay? It's a maritime program for scouting, all uh, ages like 10 to 20, right? And um, they need the sponsorship of a church. And since we've done this before, we'd like to do it again, but we need to uh, come together to vote on that just to affirm that choice. So I'm making an, an official announcement this morning, and then we'll make another one next week so that we can have an official meeting following the service two Sundays from today, and Donnie and Bonnie will explain it probably a little bit more deeply then, and we'll just give an uh, affirmative vote, I hope, to sponsor the troop and or the explorer post, the ship, I should say. We're sponsoring a ship. Wow. A ship and a maritime club. So if you're a sailor, they're going to need your help. Yes, they are, <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's an exciting program, and they're very energetic for it, so uh, they'll tell us more about it. But uh, please come two Sundays from today following the worship service, and we'll give an affirmative vote, I hope, for the program to, to be sponsored here. Uh, what else do I need to say? I think that's it. Thank you for being here this morning. Would you stand with me as we begin worship? 
We start with uh, music and a few announcements, but then we move into a quiet moment of reflection and meditation. And we do that by thinking about and focusing on a single breath. We remember that God's spirit in the Bible is the wind of God, the breath of God, and we breathe constantly. It's the mo one of the most important signs of life is breathing. So as you take this breath with me, let's imagine it as a breath from God, a breath of love, of forgiveness, of strength, of grace, of patience, of hopefulness, of kindness, of, of uh, healing. And as we let the breath go, imagine releasing to God those things that burden you this morning, whether they be worries or anxiety, sorrows, disappointments, failures, sins, whatever heaviness you bring, imagine exhaling that to God. And then we'll join in a moment of prayer and move into our worship this morning. So, a little exhale with me in one deep breath of life. Thank you, Lord, for that calming moment of breathing. Thank you for every breath that you give us. May we take none of them for granted. Thank you for our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and friends who surround us here in this special place to worship you, to sing, to pray, to listen, to fellowship, to be encouraged and strengthened in our faith. Please surround us with your loving care and hold us in your embrace. Guide us to those moments that we need of fellowship and wisdom and strength and healing. And May we leave this place energized with your spirit. Hear us now in a moment of silent prayer as we come quietly together before your throne of grace. Communion Sunday, and it is a Sunday where we ring bells. And Thelma, where's Thelma? <laughs> She's usually over a little bit, and so I lost her there in the crowd. Thelma, please come and lead us in, a, in, in the garden. And we need ringers. Young, not so young, young at heart, anybody who can see their colors is welcome. And remember to stand with your color. Right? That worked really well. So congregate with those who have the same color, please. We've got more. We've got more. We've got more. We've got more. We have plenty. We have more than there are even out there. You're supposed to stand with your same color, but I don't see anybody with yellow. Crystal can stand right with you. Oh boy. Oh well. You got me. You have the red, the black. <laughs> yeah. They're the same. Yeah. You do solid red, and you just. Oh. <laughs> but they're the same color. Just higher. Hi, orange. Oh yeah, we're supposed to stand next to our colors. Yeah. Find your color. Okay. You're my color, buddy. Yeah, okay. Who has plain red? Plain red. Yes, okay. There we go. We're good. Oh, you're our color buddy. We're all together. We're color buddies. There won't be any of our color in there. Right.
Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing together, Thine is the glory.
Thank you. Please be seated. Now we have opportunity to pray together. If you have people, situations you're praying for, would like us to join you in your prayer, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll recognize you, and first names are fine. We'll repeat them so everyone can hear. Carolyn. Grace, Donna, and Barb. Grace, Donna, and Barb. And Carolyn, I might add. Anne. Sue, Sam, and Kathy. Sue, Sam, and Kathy. Thelma. Meredith, Jordan, and Holden. Meredith, Jordan, and Holden. Um, Donna. Kyle. 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 Christine. Christine. Zach. 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 Coy. Coy. Marie. Marie. Thank you. Karen. Bob. Bob. Bobby. Bobby. And Dave and Nancy, yes, thank you. Jan. Scott and Julie. Scott and Julie. Marcy. Scott, Mike, and Jan. Scott, Mike, Jan, and Marcy. Joan. I got it right. I hey. Um, Amber. Amber. Calista. Calista. Hunter. Hunter. Matt. Matt. Myself. Yourself. And then I have a joy. And That's right. 100 days. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Philip. Davon. Joe Murphy. Joe Murphy. And, all my friends and, and all your friends and family. Eleanor. Ralph. Ralph. Charlotte. Charlotte. Rich. And Rich. And Eleanor. Sue. Brittany. Brittany. Tyson. Tyson. And, myself. and yourself. Yes. So glad you're here today. Esther, uh, Katie's family, Katie's family. And, art. and Art, okay, Jim, Tammy, Joe, and Kathy, Tammy, Joe, and Kathy. Annie, Bill, Bill. Janet, Larry. Larry, and Janet, Eileen, Jack, Jack. <laughs> Sally. Sally, Joe, Joe. Greg, Greg. Pray for Steve and Donnie. Rosie, you don't have your hand up. Edna, Edna Peggy, 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 Jamie, Jamie and, uh, Connie. Emberlin. And who? Emberlin. Emberlin? Okay, good. Dave out. Sisters. Your sisters, Mike, Mike Ed, Ed, Mark, Charlene, Frank and Jean, Frank and Jean. Ray, and Judy. Ray and Judy, Bill and Judy, Bill and Judy. Bob, and Jean. Bob and Jean, thank you very much. Um, yes, Michelle, Stephanie, Stephanie. Crystal, Crystal. Crystal. Ashley, Boyd, <coughs> Dave, Crystal, Brian. Briar and, Briar and everyone here, thank you. Crystal and Taylor helped with um, the Red Cross blood drive. In fact, Taylor's wearing the t-shirt. You want to show us all the t-shirt that, that you helped distribute? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was a great volunteer. Lots of people took t-shirts because he was modeling them. <laughs> no, seriously, that's why they did it. Yeah, yeah, it was great. We had a great, uh, th speaking of the, the blood drive, it was very successful, right, Thelma? 27 units? 27 units, yeah. 27 units. So thank you all, and thank you, Thelma, for an excellent event. <laughs> Think of all the people that will be helped seriously helped because of that. It's amazing. Would you bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we bow in gratitude for the life that you have given us, for the friends and family and brothers and sisters in faith who surround us here. We lift up to you all these people that we have named. They are dear to us. You know them. You know the, the ins and outs of their lives, exactly what's uh, afflicting or challenging them this morning and this week. And we pray that in your power and wisdom and faithfulness, you would surround them with that healing, loving presence 
that will bring them hope and courage and strength and life and vitality. And also be with their caregivers uh, who labor uh, selflessly to help their loved one negotiate and, and triumph over this challenge that they face. We pray for them as well. We realize that there are many, many people in our world who are struggling today, some with the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, clothing, safety and security, health. We pray especially for those in places of war and violence, for those who have had to flee their homes, whether because of war or because of flooding or fire or some natural disaster beyond their control. We pray for those who have lost family members, loved ones, children, parents, grandparents, friends. We pray for those whose lives have been greatly disrupted and who struggle with simply making it through each day. We pray, O oh God, for each of these and for people around them that in the midst of the struggle and the suffering, your spirit would move with power and grace and strength and that your healing touch would be evident and amazing among those in particular need. We thank you for our church family, for our friends and loved ones who pray for us, who encourage us and guide us, who lift us up when we struggle. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you continue to open our eyes and our ears to the needs around us and to be faithful stewards and caretakers of this world and of the people who share it with us. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us and the blessings that you shower upon us every day. Hear us now as we remember together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Would you join me now as we gather together and worship our tithes and our gifts?
Dear Heavenly Father, we bow in gratitude and thanksgiving for all the many blessings you shower upon us. We pray that you would receive what we brought here this morning for the work of your kingdom. We also pray that you would receive us, each of us, all that we have, all that we are, living offerings to your kingdom and your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Our gospel lesson is a continuation of John chapter 20, where last week we read the story of Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb and her encounter with Jesus that same morning. Uh, she returns and tells the other disciples that he is risen. And then that story is followed by this one. It starts at John 20, verse 19. Um, and continuing to the end of the chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. When the other disciples told him that they had seen the Lord, he declared, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. Amen. For many of us, especially those who have passed their 50th birthday, let's say. Uh, modern life poses many new challenges, not least of which is the broad array of devices that fall under the general category computer. Uh, smartphones, laptops, tablets, e-readers, smart speakers, etc., etc., etc. Emerging technology pushes us, sometimes kicking and screaming, into the role of constant student. It's not enough to choose a device and an operating system and become proficient with them. Because no sooner do we learn it than it changes. Right, Mark? Mark's the expert at this. Automatically and without our consent, in the night while we're sleeping, some team of insomniac computer geeks in Silicon Valley decides to replace a perfectly good operating system with something new. 
that now renders all our hard-earned working knowledge of computers obsolete, demoting us back to computer kindergarten. In the mix of this vexing condition of constant upgrades, we discover what kind of learners we are. Some of us learn by trial and error, a kind of hands-on approach that involves cursing, uh, punching random buttons, and sometimes dropping devices out of second-story windows. <laughs> Some of us learn by um, asking an expert, a nearby six-year-old, to show us what to do. We learn by mimicking and imitation. Some of us, probably very few of us, actually attempt to find online directions or websites where we can read the written instructions, only to find out there aren't any. <laughs> My point is this. Different strokes for different folks, right? Each of us has our own skill sets and personal preferences for how we learn best. So I see this principle at work in the realm of the spirit. Each of us encounters God uniquely because no two of us are exactly alike. To me, the evidence of this truth is everywhere. It explains why there's such a great variety of religions in the world and such a great variety even among followers of the same religion. All the various Christian denominations uh, and even within a denominational family like ours, the American Baptist Churches of the USA, there are no two churches that are exactly alike. And then within each individual church, First English Baptist, for instance, there's a great variety of religious experience between individual members of our congregation. Last Sunday, we listened to the account of Jesus' resurrection in the Gospel of John, John chapter 20, and even there, in the earliest Christian documents that we have, there is evidence of this same phenomenon. And it's actually at the center of the scripture today, the one I just read, John 19, 20, 19 to 31, and especially verses 24 to 31, the story of the disciple named Thomas. Thomas appears, the name Thomas appears in all the New Testament lists of the 12 apostles or closest disciples of Jesus, but he remains virtually unknown. No gospel speaks of him other than the list, except for John, this gospel. And it's the only one that shows Thomas as having any kind of active character. There are two other places in the gospel of John where Thomas uh, surfaces, you might say. Um, once in chapter 11, it's when Jesus is deciding to go to Bethany to uh, see Mary and Martha because their brother Lazarus has just died. And we are told that Jesus is going into hostile territory if he goes there. And hearing that, it's Thomas who says with great uh, optimism, let's all go with Jesus and we'll die with him there. The second appearance of Thomas is equally brief on the night of the Last Supper. Jesus tries to reassure the disciples that his absence from them will only be temporary, and he says these words, and you'll recognize them. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And it's Thomas who answers him and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus then says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So before the end of John, Thomas appears to be the spokesperson for the others in their confusion and in their lack of understanding of Jesus. Now in John chapter 20, Thomas takes center stage. He is the last of the 12 to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. According to John, 
Thomas is the only one of the close disciples who is not present when Jesus appears to them for the first time after the resurrection that evening of the, of the first day when they're hiding in the upper room. Mary Magdalene has already reported to them that she saw the risen Jesus, but they don't really give her much credit until that night when Jesus appears in person to them, and he shows them his nail wounds and the wound on his side, and they come to faith. But Thomas is not there on that first evening. Later, when the others tell him that they too, like the women, have seen the risen Lord, he is not convinced. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and touch the place where the nails were, unless I put my hand into the spear wound in his side, by no means shall I believe. His denial is very emphatic. He needs evidence. He needs a first-person, face-to-face, person-to-person encounter with Jesus himself. He cannot take someone else's word for it. He's what you might call a natural skeptic. He would have made a good scientist. His preferred avenue of learning is empirical evidence. You know, where's the beef? Show me what's true. This is how the theologian and poet Thomas Troger describes Thomas in a, in a poem entitled, These Things Did Thomas Count as Real? These things did Thomas count as real. The warmth of blood, the chill of steel, the grain of wood, the heft of stone, the last frail twitch of flesh and bone. The vision of his skeptic mind was keen enough to make him blind to any unexpected act too large for his small world of fact. His reasoned certainties denied that one could live when one had died until his fingers read like braille the markings of the spear and nail. One week later, all the disciples are again assembled in a locked room. This time Thomas is with them. And Jesus comes to them again, saying, peace be with you. And he turns specifically to Thomas, and he says, touch and see the nail marks in my hands, put your hand in my side, stop doubting, and start believing. And Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. Later theologians will claim that Thomas does indeed touch Jesus to be convinced. We saw some iconography and artwork that showed exactly that. But the scripture doesn't say that, nor even imply that Thomas actually touches him. He claims earlier that he has to touch him before he'll be persuaded. But as it turns out, Thomas only needs to see the wounds to change his mind. So in this way, he's not really much different from the other disciples who did not believe Mary, but had to see Jesus for themselves. But Thomas goes a step beyond all the others with his words, my Lord and my God. They say much more than simply, I believe Jesus is alive. His words are placed here as the ultimate confession of faith and allegiance and discipleship. His words say, I give to you, Jesus, the same honor, the same glory which I give to God. For your life proves God has come to us in you. 
despite Thomas's firm, hard resistance to faith at first, he actually becomes the model disciple. His words here are supposed to become our words. His confession is supposed to inspire our confession. To me, Thomas stands for every skeptic, for every nonconformist, for all independent thinkers, those who aren't afraid to ask questions, those who dare to be honest about their doubts, their uncertainties, even if in doing so they stand alone. Ultimately, Thomas's doubt becomes the strongest, deepest faith. Perhaps his honesty and his need for his own personal experience of Jesus sets him up. Maybe that primes him for a more profound leap of faith. The Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran expresses what is a counterintuitive observation, that doubt and faith are actually not all that far apart from each other. Gibran writes these words, Doubt is pain, too lonely to know that faith is his twin brother. Doubt is pain, too lonely to know that faith is his twin brother. Maybe it's only a coincidence, but the name Thomas comes directly from an Aramaic word, the, word, the language of the people then, teoma, which was not a proper name. It was simply the word twin. And the fact that people reading John didn't know Aramaic means that when it's translated as Thomas, also called Didymus. Didymus is the Greek word that also means twin. Thomas and twin. Thomas and Didymus simply mean twin. The ancient, ancient tradition held that Thomas's given name was actually Judas. And some even speculated that he was Jesus's twin brother. Of course, Scripture doesn't say that. But perhaps Thomas is like a twin to all of us anyone who carries doubts and uncertainties. What encourages me most about this story is how, in the midst of Thomas's doubt, Jesus seeks him out, intentionally, personally. And he discloses himself to Thomas in a way that addresses Thomas's need in a manner that Thomas finds convincing and persuasive. Jesus knows what Thomas needs to learn faith. Ever the good shepherd, Jesus seeks out every one of his sheep that is lost and calls each of them by name. So I started this sermon with the observation that when it comes to learning, we are all unique. That what works for you may not work for me. Different strokes for different folks. I suggested that even in John chapter 20, the story of the resurrection, one, in one single chapter of Scripture, there are four examples of the different ways that those first disciples come to faith in Jesus. In the first, the first one is the beloved disciple. All he has to do is see the, clo the cloths in the grave, empty and folded up, and he believes. For Mary Magdalene, it wasn't enough to see Jesus face to face. She had to hear him speak her name. For the original disciples, they couldn't believe on the basis of Mary's testimony alone. They needed to see Jesus and his crucifixion wounds for themselves in order to believe. And then there's Thomas, who wouldn't take the word of anybody else, would not accept the faith of even his closest friends. He had to have his own personal 
experience of Jesus alive, and then his faith takes hold. The evangelist John, who writes this, these accounts many decades after the resurrection, is actually addressing people like us, like you and me. We live too late, way late, to meet Jesus physically, person to person. The first disciples of Jesus have one type of true belief, and it's based on the visible presence of Jesus. But all the believers after them have to hold a new type of faith, one that is based on the invisible presence of Jesus. Not Jesus in the flesh, but Jesus in the spirit. At the very end of this gospel, the writer turns to us, the readers, the listeners, who are called to believe in the absence of any visual evidence. Jesus' last words to Thomas are actually intended for us. He says, because you, Thomas, have seen me, Jesus says, you believe Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Doubt is not necessarily a barrier to faith. Sometimes it's the best way to get there. Would you bow with me for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the presence of Jesus in our lives and in our world. We live with many uncertainties. But with this, we can be certain that you are here, that you live, that you are personal, that you are present. We need not see you or touch you to know that your presence is powerful and real. As we share the bread and cup this morning, symbols of your presence, may they reaffirm to us your presence here with us and within us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing together Spirit Song?
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread on the table, he broke it. He told his disciples, this is my body, which I give for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as a reminder, if anyone is visiting with us this morning, you don't need to be a member of First English Baptist Church. You don't need to be a Baptist, per se, to join us in this communion meal. This is the Lord's table and the Lord's supper. And all who are called to him are invited to this table. So we hope that you'll participate with us. Would you join me as we offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the bread and the cup? Gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before these symbols of your death and resurrection of your son. And we thank you that they remind us once again of Jesus' living presence here with us, within us. As we take the bread and share it, as we share the cup, may we be reminded that in that death we are set free to a new life, and in that life we are yours. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us in this day and always. In Jesus' name, amen. the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Every time we eat this bread, we're reminded that our spiritual life is filled by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Would you join me as we eat this bread together?
Afterwards, in the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. we hold, hold reminds us that Christ lives, that he lives in us, that he is personal and present. Would you join me as we drink this cup together? As part of our communion worship service, we typically read some words together. Today we're reading the mission statement 
of First English Baptist Church. It's up on your screen, or if you prefer, it's in the back of your hymnal as well. And we read this to remind ourselves of who we are, who we are called to be, and why we're here. So we'll meditate on these words as we read them together. First English Baptist Church is a family of faith. of this mission that we receive a second offering on communion Sundays. It's entirely separate from the weekly offering supporting the, the um, weekly expenses of the church. This is an offering to the Deacon Fellowship Fund and uh, the deacons whom we elect uh, on our behalf oversee this fund of money as an emergency uh, supply for anyone in our congregation who finds himself in financial need in an emergency and many people have been greatly blessed by this you are extremely generous um, if you feel moved today to be part of this offering in any amount um, Philip and Karen on behalf of the deacons will be glad to receive it
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.